any videographer editor in that position right now that should be like the number one thing you try to learn whether it's short form a 15 second video or a 50 minute long youtube video like learning how to tell a story and take a viewer through an experience is the biggest thing when it comes to video welcome back to another episode i'm sitting here today with connor newell if you don't know him he is the owner of vertical video pro as well as he produces some amazing content on his instagram his tiktok so you guys should definitely check him out there connor thanks so much for coming on yeah thanks bobby stoked stoked for this excited to be here awesome so you know i kind of rambled through the intro there a little bit but i'd love to give you the opportunity to tell people who you are what you do where you're from and that sort of thing yeah, for sure. So, um, like you said, you know, Connor Newell, I own a company called Vertical Video Pro. It's a video editing uh, agency. So we work with a lot of mainly realtors and, and lenders, but uh, any sort of business owners editing their video content. Um, started that a couple of years ago. Before that, I ran a video production company with one of my buddies from college. Um, I played college baseball. Him and I kind of got into the video thing and um, realized that we could kind of make some money with it, helping different businesses with their video content. Um, so did that for a while. Um, I know like we were talking about earlier, worked at Vayner for, for a stint as well. Um, but yeah, based here in Oregon now, um, been in the video space for a long, long time doing different things. So stoked to kind of dive into a little bit more of it today. Awesome. So you brought up real estate, and I think that's kind of how our paths originally crossed, at least content-wise, I think because we're kind of playing in this ball game here. So why don't you talk to me a little bit about kind of your take on the current state of real estate content and how you, your company, and your clients try to put a different spin on that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, for realtors, I mean, creating content, being on the internet, being on social media is huge. And I think everyone knows that, but I think a lot of people just think, oh, I need to be on social, I need to create content, or I just need to have an Instagram. But a lot of people don't really have a plan or a strategy when it comes to social media. So they kind of do some stuff here and there. And they're like, well, I know I need to do this. And maybe I get like a little bit of business from it. But it's more just so people know what I do. Um, but yeah, I think a big piece that a lot of realtors are missing is kind of the strategy side of things and really having a plan to maximize their growth and their exposure on social media um, to actually generate leads from their content and from you know their social media presence. So while being on social is great for realtors, I definitely see a big gap there where um, people may be creating content, they may be on the platforms, but maybe not have a great strategy to actually generate leads and generate business from the platforms so of course and obviously considering the very interesting housing market time that we live in and you've been doing this for a while have you noticed a shift in just kind of the type of content that realtors are looking to create are they focusing it more at sort of listing leads buyer leads general kind of market updates yeah i mean um yeah definitely a shift especially with this short form content it's changed what type of content we really focus on and what we create because before you know the big viral short form that tiktok basically yep. created um you know i did video work for realtors not necessarily short form but i would do listing videos and those were great to you know showcase the different aspects of a listing but those don't perform on social you know like if you post a widescreen full length three minute long listing video on instagram you, it's a waste of a post in my opinion but if you can reform that into vertical cut it down to 15 seconds use a trending song and really you know even add the instagram um you know stories like text like on the video you know what i'm saying yep. um that's going to perform 10 times better so you could actually take that listing video and cut it down into three or four different reels or shorts or whatever and get way better performance that way. So I think that's a huge way sure. that content has shifted in the real estate market. I think a lot more educational content is starting to come out, you know, with it being so easy to literally just turn your iPhone on, talk about a subject matter for, you know, 30 seconds to a minute and get a post out. That's a lot different than, 
the type of content people were creating, you know, two years ago. So I think the educational content, I think the entertainment content with listing videos and things like that has been huge. Um, you know, as well as podcasts too, if you want to go away from the short form and get into more of the long form stuff, I think podcasts have, have been really a big piece for realtors lately to be able to kind of talk about the current status of the housing market. Obviously the last three years has been unlike any other time with interest rates mm-hmm. going to yeah. record lows to almost record highs to inventory shortage. Like it's been crazy. And I think that's a huge opportunity for realtors to get the proper message out to consumers. Cause a lot of people think the housing market's going to crash. There's all these things happening. I'm going to wait. And the reality is pretty much across the country, there's a housing shortage, you know? So it's your job as a realtor to educate your community and your clients on what's actually happening. And I think the best way to do that right now is through video on social media. I love that. And I, and you touched on it for a second there. Obviously at BAM, that's something we preach wholeheartedly in terms of bringing your clients the most pertinent and up-to-date information first, shooting straight and making sure that everybody's on the same page. So you you touched on it a little bit. You said that a lot of people are doing green screen and stuff. As somebody in your position, as somebody who looks to create videos, what is kind of the value pitch that you give to people when all these platforms are coming out with content like uh, green screen and all the trending stuff? I'd love to know a little bit more about your process in terms of prospecting and onboarding clients. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the biggest thing that I say, well, there's a couple of things. Number one, I think is, you know, you need to be active on social media. If you are not, other people are, and they're taking away your market share. Um, If you're, I I don't want to say ignorant, but apprehensive to start on social and to start building kind of your personal brand on there, other people are super excited about it and taking that opportunity and that's taking market share away from you. You know, you can even think about it as like um, Google AdWords or or bidding on, on AdWords. If you if you aren't bidding on those AdWords, if you're not creating the content, other people are, and it's pushing you out. Um, it's the new way that people are finding and connecting um, with professionals, with realtors, and doing transactions is through social. I mean, I can't tell you how many people that I've met and connected with in the space only from creating content on social media. I mean, exactly how you and I cr- connected. Yep. It's the way that people meet now is digitally. Um, So that's definitely one side of things is, you know, people need to know who you are and what you do and you need to bring value to them. And then the other side, you know, from the agency standpoint, my pitch there is really, you know, you shouldn't necessarily be the one spending all the time editing your own videos. You can do it. You can learn it. There's great tools out there. There's AI out there now. But at the end of the day, you have to do the work, you have to be the creative, and you're not really a creative. I mean, some realtors are very creative and some realtors do great video content on their own, but that's not everybody. So really where my agency comes in is is taking very experienced editors who edit all day, every day, and creating the best content for you while saving you all that time. I love that. I love that. And I definitely want to touch on both of those things because you brought up AI and I was going to touch on that a little bit later, but I think we could cut to it right now because obviously there's all this big hubbub in this space with stuff like Opus and vid.io. What's your take on all this stuff, man? Because I feel like some of it hits right on this money with like Adobe and especially like the generative fill stuff like that. Like I use that all the time or like their podcast software. But like, have you found that the clip, how far away, I guess is the question I'm trying to ask. How far away you think from clips being replaced, at least in identifying hooks and putting together strong narratives, are we? Oh man, it's really tough to say just based off how fast it learns. Obviously it came in super quick. Like it just hit the scene and it's the new hot thing. Um, (laughs) But there's still so many gaps in the technology. At the end of the day, I mean, like I said, how fast it learns is going to be everything. But you need a human creative to actually draft content that's compelling because uh-huh. technology and AI doesn't necessarily know what the best hook in the right order is needed to reach someone on a psychological level on social media. You know, it's just um, going to say like, oh, this is a new, like it can subject out topics just like YouTube, you know, auto generates chapters. It can basically understand 
what subjects are being talked about, but it doesn't know, um, you know, the best hook to use, doesn't necessarily know all the creative tools to use. I think a human is still the best creative tool out there. AI can do the technical side of things and chop stuff up. But yeah, I, th I think a human definitely is needed for that creative aspect. Um, there's still a ton of errors even in the in the AI generated clips. You know, text is up and then it's down and then yep. it's missing. Like if it's changing color, one of the letters isn't changed to that different yep, color. Yep, and... yep. The captions are <laughs> notorious for that one. Yeah, there there's tons of errors in it still, which I think is probably going to be the first thing to get cleaned up. But as far as like the subject matter, like, I don't know, I still feel like a human is going to be the only one who actually understands what someone's talking about. And even little things like um, errors in like what they're hearing, like you may, the AI might not be able to hear or interpret a word, but a human can say, oh, that's the word that they like were trying to say or were saying and can like make that change. But yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. It's a great tool. It can save a ton of time. But at the end of the day, you still have to understand um, the creative side of editing and what works and what doesn't. And you have to spend the time to actually tell the AI what to do, uploading the content and all that. So I don't know. It's tough to say how close it is. I think it's a cool tool. But I still think we're definitely a few years away from it doing a lot more and taking away um, the human element of it. I'm right there with you. I, I think it's a lot of smoke right now. I, I totally agree where I call it. You're always going to need somebody who speaks editor, right? Like you always have the client. Can, can we make it cooler? Can yeah. we make it more cinematic? Like yeah. you're going to need that translation. It's like, no, we need we need to bump the keyframes over. We need to slow the speed down. Let's smooth this transition out. Like you're always going to need that in the mix there. So I, I totally agree with you. I'd love to... Before we get into, obviously, your agency, I'd love to kind of roll the clock back a little bit because you were at one of the biggest agencies there is, the, you know, kind of the the mecca where a lot of people get their drive originally to want to be a video creative. Tell me about your time at Vayner, what you learned, and kind of how you bring that into your day-to-day -day running your business now. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Vayner was awesome. It was an incredible opportunity. Just to give you a little context, I basically started watching Gary's content in late 2015. So it was like pretty early for the most part when I started watching his content, <laughs> loved his message, loved his drive, loved his like entrepreneurial um, motivation and stuff like that. And I watched his content pretty consistently for, I'd say two years. And I was in college at this point. I was in, that was my junior year. So then going into my senior year, kept watching, like when all my friends were, downstairs playing video games late at night i was watching gary's vlogs and learning Love about it. business and that type of stuff so i graduated college moved back home worked for my dad's business for a while knew i wanted to work for vayner but the idea of moving to new york i'm from the west coast from oregon so like the idea of moving to new york and like doing that whole thing scared the shit out of me i was like i don't think i could do that um but D Rock, uh, Gary's videographer, posted on Twitter one day that they were they had a job opening for their LA office, and I was like, oh, okay, I've spent some time in Southern California, have tons of friends down there. It's still West Coast, like that would be an easy move. So I remember thinking to myself, I was like, well, I might as well apply and just see what happens because if I don't, it's definitely not going to happen. So applied for it, ended up getting the job. They were like, how soon can you move down here? I was like, uh, two weeks. <laughs> so. I hit up some friends. I couch surfed for like the first month, month and a half maybe, before I finally found a place. And um, yeah, it was a great experience. Basically, my job there was I was a videographer and editor. So I'd been doing video for about a year at this point, year and a half maybe. And my job was basically following other people around similar to Gary. So just like Gary's vlogs and stuff like that, we were creating that for other clients. So CEOs, artists, athletes, um, people like that. I would basically travel with them, film their events, um, film different um, just day-to-day -day operations, meetings, things like that, then cut it into vlogs, cut it into the old short form content where it was like the square post, you had like the title, Yep, of course, of course, yeah. The captions down below, 
the little timer from left to right that went through the video. <coughs> so did that for about a year and it was, it was a great experience. I got, um, you know, experience working with high level individuals, experience traveling, experience working with a team, working with at a big company and seeing kind of the ins and outs of the operations from pitch decks to client relations and, um, everything like that. So it was definitely a great experience for me because I grew so much. And the biggest thing for me there was when you're filming someone's day to day, no matter how cool they are or how awesome they are, filming someone's full day is pretty boring. Like mm -hmm. it's, just, it's, it is. So there's only oh, so many over the shoulder zoom calls you can make cool. Yep, exactly. I gotcha. So the biggest thing that I took away from that was learning how to tell a story through video, like learning, okay, Love here's it. what the day was about. What do we need to highlight? How can we connect a to B to C? How can we, you know, get the viewer to continue watching? That was by far the biggest takeaway that I got from it. And I think any videographer editor in that position right now, that should be like the number one thing you Seriously. try to learn, whether it's short form, a 15 second video, or a 50 minute long YouTube video, like learning how to tell a story and take a viewer through an experience is the biggest thing when it comes to video. So that was probably the biggest thing I took away from it. Um, but yeah, about after a year of that kind of felt like I hit my ceiling, wasn't a ton of room for growth there. And I kind of wanted to go off and do my own thing. So that's what I did. I love it. I got, I got to just say that is so funny that you sort of found your way into the industry off a D Rock tweet because that's exactly how I found myself at BAM. Okay. Uh, Byron, Byron, at CEO, our CEO, tweeted at D Rock. He retweeted it. I liked it. And then, yeah, much the same. Like a couple weeks later, it was, was all in on the video production stuff. That is too funny. I love yeah, that. That's awesome. Um, so, so I loved what you said there about storytelling. I'm a big proponent of. I think all creatives should work in sales, right? Like you said, you went to college. Did you also get uh, scammed on a film degree like I did? Um, scammed on a marketing degree, yeah. Okay, so very similar. Every, every, everything that uh, we learned, we learned on our feet. So I'm right there with you there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm a big believer that all creatives in the space, and especially if they're working for a brand and they're trying to use video to convert for the business, should at least spend some time cold calling. Mm -hmm. Because it's, in my opinion... That is the bedrock of what you're doing with video, right? You have somebody for a very small period of time and you have to get them to buy into whatever you're trying to present to them. Yep. So I, I totally agree that storytelling is probably the most important thing, right? Like you you can cook in any kitchen if you know how to cook type thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I love it. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. I, it's, um, you know, you can make any video the highest quality, the most cinematic, <laughs> like all that, but it's funny, even I kind of gauged my videos when I would show it to one of my friends and like how fat, how long it would take before they like glanced away or like checked hmm. their phone is like, be like, oh, can you watch this video real quick? They start watching it and then they like check their phone really quick. I'm like, oh, okay. So that like that section maybe needs to be tweaked or like something else. But yeah, I think just learning how to craft that story and take a viewer through a journey and through an experience is huge. So. Other than obviously getting as many at bats as possible with creative content, what is your kind of advice to people to build that muscle of the storytelling? Is it just do, 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 do? Is it try to emulate content? What is your best strategy for people who want to get into the industry? Man, that's a really good question. I mean, the way I learned it was by creating vlogs for people. Um, obviously, I don't, I don't think vlogs necessarily are gone. I think they just look different now. Obviously, a lot of people are doing now those TikTok vlogs. You yep. know, it's just a 60 second day in the life. A guy who does a really great job of this. Um, oh man, his name. Tim? No, it's no. not Tim. Um, There's the other dude with the slick back hair. I, I think, think he's it's in LA. Jack Cook is his name. Yeah, Jack Cook. Yes, yep. yes, that's him. Yep. He does an amazing job on TikTok telling stories um and it's just like a 60 second TikTok. everything shot with his iphone but he does a great voiceover with it gets great clips it's super engaging so i think the vlog looks a little different now than it used to you know three four years ago 
But I would say like that daily vlog content, mm -hmm. if you really want to test that creative muscle and work on your storytelling would be creating daily vlogs and seeing how engaging you can make them. Um, if you can get any to go viral, I would say that might be one of the best ways to experiment and try and learn that skill set of storytelling is doing a daily vlog, whether that's obviously YouTube, which is a lot more work or just like TikTok vlogs that are a lot shorter. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, those that doing that because you're taking basically someone's boring day that seems super repetitive and making it interesting and connecting with viewers and, and things like that. So I think that I think that would be a great place to start. I, I'm i totally right there with you. Obviously, when agents come to us and they they look to us as kind of the what what is hot in content, right? Like everybody's looking at Eric, the broke agent. Everybody wants to know what the Instagram algorithm is. But when you see people like Jack or you see my my favorite example of this is I'm sure you've gotten served these the carpet, the guy with the carpet cleaning guy. And it's just like long takes of this guy pressure washing dirty carpets. Oh, yeah. With, yeah, a, yeah. with a yeah, with yeah. a voice. And I'm like. This is probably the most mundane job in the world, right? You can't you know, look you away. Look, you can't look away. Yeah. And you get, you know, a lot of the times realtors or really anybody at the front face of their own business is like, well, my life isn't that great. What am I doing? I'm just setting up snacks for an open house. I'm like, yeah, but to other people, that's fun. What happened with the snacks? Why didn't it work out? Was it too hot? Was there a problem with this? Like, there's always something to get people to want to continue and buy into whatever you're trying to convey to them. So I love that. I think that's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. So I'd love to kind of move into the more nitty gritty, the real nerdy production stuff with you. So you said your kind of metric of when you were coming up was watching people and watching how long before they looked away from your vlog. Is that the North Star in your business that you're looking to convert for clients now? Is it retention? Is it conversions into their IDX page or leads? How are you guys measuring success on a clip? And I guess, what does that look like in the edit? Yeah, for sure. So it comes down to a few things. Um, number one, and everyone hears this, but your hook is everything. That's how you're going to grab the person's attention. Um, the way I like to kind of describe a hook, because people take the hook out of context a little bit and they think like, oh, I need to do something crazy or or grab the person's attention or say something like shocking. It's like, not necessarily. All you need to do is either say something or show something that grabs the person's attention. That's engaging. Like that is interesting and it tells the person what they can expect if they keep watching the video. So what can you say or do or show in those first three to five seconds that grabs someone's attention, especially with short form content is think about when these people are consuming the content right like i always use the example of like standing in line at the grocery store mm -hmm. a, i'm still old school and go to the grocery store i'm like the online instant cart i don't stuff. want people touching my food man i'm right there with you it's like i want to i want to pick my stuff I, I get you exactly i'm picky about that so i always tell people like think about like you know when people are consuming this content it's standing in line at the grocery store standing in line for coffee you know they're not doing anything so there's quickly scrolling their phone and they're just thumb flicking, you know, just thumb flicking their phone. And what can you do or say or show in your video that's going to be so in interesting and engaging to someone that makes them stop and want to con continue watching? So that's the hook. Obviously, to retain that attention is going to be the story, right? And that's why I think storytelling is so powerful is because you obviously have to tie in the hook to the rest of the video. You have to give value and you have to keep that person engaged by kind of, you know, some up and downs through your content. Um, so that would be like one metric is like the hook. Obviously, that's going to be like how many people stop to watch. Um, total views is obviously a big proponent. And what I try to look like when a video gets, you know, 10x the number of views that another video gets it's like okay what's different about this like was the first clip different was the hook different like was it filmed like did we have some sort of um you know pattern interrupt where they changed locations like what happened in this video that allowed it to get 10x or more views than all the other ones so it's kind of you know a few different things like what is that hook what is the opening shot um, you know, I've noticed more in my content now is 
the talking head, like where it's just me sitting in my chair, gets like super repetitive. Okay. But the stuff where I'm kind of out doing the different activity and then voice over the content has been getting way better engagement. So I think it's kind of that pattern interrupt. Um, voice over content, I think, is, is doing really well right now. So those are kind of a few things that we look at when it's like, okay, what video did really well? And obviously it's like the hook, it's how it's shot. And also, you know, the subject. That's another thing is when you have a video do really well, you can do a couple of different things. You can expand on that subject because clearly people were interested in about it. So can you talk, you know, can you create two, three, four extra videos going a little bit more in depth on that subject matter? Or can you even just take that video and repost it again a few weeks later? You know, because clearly if it gets 50,000 views or so on a video, it's like, okay, let me wait a few weeks. Let me repost that, get another 50,000 and get more people coming to my page. So that's something a few things. As far as generate leads from social, this is a huge thing. This is when I'm working more with like my one-on-one -on -one clients who I can like give like customized, you know, plans to. But it would be optimizing the optimizing getting opt-ins from social. So mm -hmm. the way I like to think about it is TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, all of those are like very top of funnel. And that's like all your views, right? Like you post to those platforms to get attention. Instagram is really like the conversion tool because that's where people are super comfortable buying things, super comfortable having conversations. And your link in bio is like, everyone knows where your link in bio is and like they're very comfortable going there. Yep. So that's definitely the conversion hub is like kind of all the platforms are used for views, funnel it into Instagram and have a really strong lead magnet whether that's a free ebook or guide or webinar or VSL or even just like your active listings um, and collecting customer information. Like what can I yep. give somebody in order for their name and email so that they're now an actual lead <laughs> that I can market to. So I think that's a big piece that a lot of realtors are missing out on right now um, yeah. is optimizing um, like a page for conversions and collect information. You're you're speaking right to the BAM playbook. <laughs> Obviously, that is our number one thing. Obviously, with BAMX, we want to give people as much value as possible, whether that is the, the eBooks or the courses. So we're right in line on that. I guess my, my question would be in terms of consistently trying to smooth out the rough patches in a video, are you retroactively going back and re-editing videos for clients or just moving forward and getting better because i've heard it both ways the case made where it's like i'll go and tweak a video until it gets x view or x save then i've also heard it where it's like no we just learn and go forward yeah um i've done it a little bit for my own content with the agency it's a little i mean that's a scale business it's just tough mm -hmm. to actually like re-edit videos for clients kind of on repeat but for my one-on-one -on -one clients I would do that if they post something and then we have another meeting, I would be like, hey, like this video probably should perform better. Like, let's change the hook or let's tweak this and see if we can get it to improve. I've done it for my own content. I have an example on TikTok where it was just a clip of me sitting down at a coffee shop and like taking a sip of coffee. So it was just like a regular day in the life, like B-roll clip, you know, with the text on the screen with value. And it got like 800 views. I was like, that's crap. Like that. We should have got way more. So literally all I did was I changed the hook, like the first text that popped up. I can't mm -hmm. remember what I changed it to, but I changed that text and then I just centered everything. And I don't know if that made a difference, but I definitely know the hook grabbed people's attention more than the original one because I made it a lot more specific and like fifth grade terms. That's why yeah, I tell sure. a lot of people is like, don't overcomplicate things, especially in real estate is like people don't know all the terms and all the lingo that you do like simplify it so a fifth grader could understand so i did that and when i reposted it it's now at twenty thousand views and continuing to grow like every single day so i mean yeah that's one example where like literally just changing the title like the text on the top of the screen was the difference between 800 views and twenty thousand. love that 
Love that. My, I guess where I want to steer the conversation is a little bit into the production side of things, right? So when you're working with both your editing clients and your agency clients, first of all, uh, obviously agency, you're doing one-on-one work, but how are you differentiating your editing from your agency? Are people sending you raw clips? Or are you guys actually producing them, whether that's over Zoom? Like, take me through the kind of directorial process there. Yeah, so pretty much all of my stuff is remote, Mm-hmm. Um, my editing agency is completely remote. All of my clients are all over the country and even Canada and other countries, um, which is basically that's all on them to film all the content, send it into us. I do give them um, a mini course that I created, which is just like a jump start to creating short form content, gives them kind of all the tools and kind of a, you know, get started intro into short form, how to position your camera, what microphone you might need. Um, what settings you should film on, stuff like that. So that's like a very ground level, like entry level um, piece of education. How are, you, Ed, how are you finding the adoption? And I don't mean to cut you off there. I oh, apologize. No, but how are you finding the adoption? Because I find it hard sometimes to speak camera to people, right? So it's very easy for me to be, yeah, just double double your frame rate, match your shutter speed. And, you know, obviously don't sit with your back to the way. Very easy for us to go back and forth. But what are the ways that you're kind of simplifying the creation process to people who are doing it remotely? I'd love to get your take on that. Yeah, so my mini course, my goal was to make it as simple and easy as possible to literally go through and watch it in like four or five days. Um, So none of the videos are longer than five minutes. Um, I also tell all my clients, like, unless you're really wanting to buy like $5,000 worth of gear, like just use your iPhone because that like the two biggest difference makers in the quality of content is not what camera you use, but how good of lighting and audio you use. Yep. That is everything. Like literally I can make my iPhone look better or just as good as my Canon R6. Like <laughs> it's crazy what lighting and good audio can do for a video. So uh, that's one thing. And then I guess um, kind of simplifying it, I'm working on an ebook right now hint hint collecting leads um for like getting started with video equipment like what do you need from a budget setup with your iphone to like okay let's say you do want to spend some money and get a nice camera like what do you need what are the settings like how to do it um because yeah you're right like i see it all the time people will go out and buy three thousand dollars worth of camera gear and their videos look shittier than before because yep they don't know how to use it the frame rates off like the white balance is all jacked up like it just looks horrible. Um, that's really what I want to like steer people away from is like, look, you don't need three grand worth of gear to make videos for reels. Like use your iPhone, um, like tweak a few settings, get good lighting, get good audio um, and go from there. And then, you know, maybe as you want to look a little bit more professional or like beef it up a little bit. Yeah, sure. But to get started, just using your iPhone, a couple of cheap lights, um, and a good microphone is a huge difference maker for sure. Total, I totally agree. It's it's so funny that yeah, it, pe- people buy the equipment and then they they don't understand what they're getting into when they buy it. Obviously, the financial thing. But I always tell people like, do you don't understand how heavy for prolonged periods of time? I'm sure you've gotten it before. Like, I'm going to start a vlog. You know these people. You, we we've we've bought. I want to start a vlog. Mm-hmm. So they go out, they get the DSLR, and then they hold the camera out minute and a half like shit this, this is heavy or it's raining like there's always these you know i can't because things that come up and that's why i'm, I'm right there with you like yeah the iphone good window good light that's 100 percent the way to do it and scale from there you're better off and i've even thought about doing this is just buying a new iphone just for creating content like just like buy a little iphone a little like rig or um you know case where you can mount either a light or a microphone on and using that like exclusively for creating content would be a way better investment than, you know, a fifteen hundred two thousand dollar camera. So, totally agree. Because then you got to buy a lens. It's got to be fast. You got to make sure that everything is, you know, that's the thing that in yeah, the right way that people don't understand is like, oh, I'm gonna buy this super nice Sony A7 III camera with a kit lens because they don't understand yeah. that the lens is literally the most important part. Like, yeah. you could buy a five hundred dollar camera, but if like buy a $1,500 lens and it's going to look way better than, you know, a $3,000 camera with a kit lens. So 
That's that's what I, I tell people all the time is lenses are the one place where you should get really specific about what it is that you're making and invest in the best, yep. right? Like that's not the place to cheap out because you can get pretty dangerous with like two or three solid lenses that cover a good range. You'll swap your camera bodies out every two, three years. Like that's mm-hmm. that's a given. But you get into the right ecosystem, like the E mount on Sony. I just I just can't ever leave Sony because I no matter what I do, all my lenses fit. You know what I mean? Yep. yep. Yeah. If you get you get a seventy two hundred two point eight on any camera, it's gonna look like butter. So Yep. Yep. Exactly. I was actually thinking about um it's funny, I was just having this conversation. I was like, I love that Tamron 35 to 150. And then I looked it up. I'm like, this thing is probably so heavy, I will never want to keep it in my backpack. Yeah. At all. I was like, mm, I don't know if it's worth the price tag. Yeah. So when you're going through, obviously <coughs> they have the ebook, they have kind of this little intro thing. Are you sitting with them and kind of directing them on how to deliver the hook, how to kind of better and more eloquently deliver the lines to have their content improve or it's just kind of tweaks and feedback after the fact, after you've reviewed the footage? Yeah, so I do that with my in-person stuff. So I do a little bit of like local stuff with some realtors here where we'll go in, set up, you know, the nice equipment um, and film their reels for them. I'll script it all out. And yeah, in that stuff, I, you know, deliver the message. Okay, tweak this, say it this way, a little more energy, use your hands a little bit more um stuff like that um over the over zoom it's really really tough to do that um so i more do like ideation with clients we'll come up with good topics hooks write out the scripts um and everything like that and then also get like their kind of like studio like set up like okay like i'll help them like set up their phone like okay it should be maybe this far away pointing into this corner of the room Maybe mm-hmm. adding a light back here, a plant back here. Um, so kind of sprucing up their space to look, you know, a little more professional um, and then scripting the content with them. But as far as like actually the deliverance of the message and how they're saying everything, it's just it's really tough to do over Zoom. So I don't really do that stuff remote. Got it. Got it. Yeah, I'm I'm much in agreement where we've had people we we worked with smaller freelance teams try to do the Zoom thing and it works to a certain degree, but the in person where you can sort of read the body language, I I I'm right there. Yeah, yeah. it's it's a hundred percent. You will always yield better clips because you're able to build that rapport with the person and have them deliver the content more naturally. For sure. Yeah. When it comes to the post production, I know you brought up your team a little bit earlier. You guys are all remote. How many are you? What are, what are you guys playing? Is it Premiere? Is it DaVinci? How are you guys kind of coordinating day to day on edits? Yeah. So we use Premiere uh, for all of our editing. Uh, it's just the easiest. That's what I've always used. Um, We're also in an abusive relationship with Premiere Pro at BAM. So, yes. yeah, I, I feel you. It's, um, it's not the uh, easiest software to use, but it's probably the best option i guess um especially when it comes to like captioning videos because it has the auto captions feature so it's just super easy um so we use that um yeah like you said team is fully remote um we had we've gone through like some shifts um over the last year um we had up to probably eight team members that were like part-time and full-time um now we've trimmed down to just four full-time um employees so um yeah that's our team now we use a great software um project management tool called service provider pro and that's like our own yeah if you want to check it out it's amazing for we're on monday so i've never heard that's awesome tell me about that so service service provider pro is basically a service it's like a client portal for service businesses. So we obviously sell our video editing through it. You can sell SEO through it. Um, you could sell blogging, like writing blog articles, like all that. Um, so essentially what it does is it allows you to create different um, products with pricing and, and details and stuff like that. And then as soon as a client signs up, they get access into the portal, which mm-hmm. is where they can upload all their content. So they upload all their content to us. They can fill out basically an order form, which you can customize. So you can say like, 
whatever information you want to intake from the client, you know, whether it's video files, description, links to other videos, you can collect all that. And then you can kind of see the status of each order. You can see how many orders they have left in the month. If they're paying like for a certain quantity, um, it'll deduct like with each order that they submit. Um, it's been a game changer. Like I literally could not run my business without it because it just organizes the delivery and like project management side of my business so easily. Um, so yeah, that's been great. So between that software and then the other one I use is go high level, which is like my CRM. So that's just leads and building landing pages, calendars, email campaigns. So that's where all that lives. So between those two, that's kind of my, the two project management tools that I use for my business. Um, you know, we use Discord within our team, but interesting. See, I, I'm I'm like the only Discord advocate at BAM. Byron's gonna watch this video one day and like totally clown on me. He's very anti Discord. We're we're a Slack company. Um yeah. I, I think Discord's the better product personally. I think the you know the only but... thing that I wish Discord would update or create is voice messages. Yep. Because I use that in like iMessage all the time and Slack has it and Discord doesn't. But I'm like Discord's just like so much better for so many reasons. Um, but yeah, it's just like if they could just add voice messages, like that's the one thing that I would absolutely love. So I love that. So you're not, so you're not using, I guess my question was more like internally with the team. You guys aren't using like a Notion, a Monday or Asana to kind of coordinate feedback or even like frame something like that. What is your correspondence with the editing team on, on kind of creative? Yeah, so we do use a uh, frame. That's where all of our revisions go through. So obviously editor edits a video, they send it to our um, client success manager is the one who reviews all the videos. Um, he'll leave notes or you know reply back and just say like, it's good to go. Um, so yeah, we do use frame for reviewing videos and like quality control. Um, I use Notion personally for different things it's yep. just an easy like idea dump tool um but yeah nothing really for my team outside of those three i guess love it love it i mean we we when i came into the company they were already on monday so it was kind of baked into the deal i love it i've, I've quickly become a big proponent of monday notion's my close second though where i love notion and uh we use miro for kind of our brain dumps and and kind of big strategy sessions there Gotcha. Client success manager. That's interesting. So why don't we go into a little bit of how you guys are structured as an editing organization? Because obviously you're the front of the business. Nobody really knows the the editors or anything like that. What is kind of your pipeline of feedback between client has signed up on the page, they've sent you their clips, cool, and client then receives the finished clip. Walk me through your kind of whole step process there. Because I like that title. I think it's a very interesting play into the overall kind of business yeah um i mean my goal of this was to make the process as easy as possible on all of our clients um <laughs> and that's where you know that uh software service provider pro comes in so basically client signs up with us they get a welcome email from the portal to create a login um and go into it um, they also get a welcome email from me with different information. That's where they get access to the course and stuff like that. Um, basically, the portal contains um, their subscription so they can update their subscription whenever they want, uh, manage that, uh, upload their orders. So obviously their orders would be like their videos. So they'll put in what's the title of the video, description, how they want it edited if they want b-roll if they want background music how long they want it to be um attach the clips link any <laughs> prior videos of them that they want to edit similarly to or another video of someone else that they like um so they basically dump all that into a like intake form like a project mm -hmm. form our editor will each editor gets assigned to each client so as soon as a client uploads a video that editor gets a notification with a new order so they'll take all that information, download the video, get to editing, um, edit that video, email that to our CSM, and um, CSM will review it, go through the frame link, um, attach any notes if needed, and then write back and say, hey, like left a few notes. 
um, editor will make revisions. And then once the video is done in that same order form, the editor can just reply back to the client and just say like, Hey, your video is done. It's attached here. And then they just click in the down and download it. So the client can also communicate back and forth with the editor. So if there is like another revision, something they want changed, when the editor sends them the video, all they have to do is either reply to that email or reply inside of the portal and just say like, hey, um, can you actually like make this change or whatever? Um, so they do have like communication with the editor as well um, through the portal. So I like I that. that. So your your uh, client success manager, is that somebody who's been on the other side of the screen? Is that somebody who's, you know, done the editing themselves? Yeah, so his hire was... Originally, he came to me as an editor. Uh, he was one of my part-time guys, did a really good job, always a super hard worker. And he reached out, or he was local with me, actually, like here in Oregon. And we connected one day, and he's like, hey, like, I love what you're doing with this company. Like, I really want to be, like, a bigger part of it and continue to grow with it. If any other opportunities come up or anything like that, like, I would love to be considered. So about six months later, we, you know, really started to grow and I needed someone to manage not only like the video revisions, but more of like the, you know, client relations. Like if a client has an issue or a problem or has a question, like I needed someone to be able to handle all of that support and things like sure. that. And it was way, it was tough because it was my first like big full-time hire outside of an editor, which I already had like a process for. And obviously a video editor, it's like, Okay, I need you to edit videos like it's easy. Yeah. But a client success manager is like, man, I don't even know what I need you to do. It's just like all the bullshit that I have to deal with every day. Like I yep. kind of need someone else to handle this. So it's like all these random tasks a little bit. And I was like, man, how do I find someone for this position? Like, how do I even, you know, um, um interview right. people, hire people? And it just hit me one day. I was like, man, this kid's always he's been with me for a while. <laughs> He, he, you know, expressed interest in growing with the company. I was like, let me just see if he would be a good fit. And it was like the perfect fit. He's so good at it. Um, it was, I don't know how I didn't think of it earlier, but it's just one of those things where it's like, it worked out perfectly. And it opened my eyes to the idea of like hiring from inside as well, mm -hmm. rather than like trying to fill the company with like new people. It's like, okay, how can we bring people in at like an entry level role or like a simpler, like role and then move them up in the company as as we grow so I, I think that's one of the best ways to do it is like bring someone in kind of at a starting position and then move them up as as we start to grow and and need that person uh or need that role so that's kind of how that came about yeah i love it i mean i at bam one of our core values is obviously accountability and we kind of give the people on the team, especially as newer hires, like I always tell the story, uh, I had an intern last year, she's one of our junior producers now because she came in, she was hungry for it, she understood the overall flow of the business and was bought into it and was very accountable in making sure the videos performed well and mm -hmm. were produced at a high level. Are you guys uh, in Vertical Video Pro, uh, Pro, are you guys utilizing VAs at all or is it all sort of hires? No, it's all hires. Um, I mean, most of my editors are overseas obviously um but yeah i don't have any vas i don't have anyone who does like um like day-to-day -day tasks or like client outreach or like anything like that or managing the pipeline i kind of do most of that stuff still um and then yeah it's just editors and a uh, client success manager and that's basically the the whole team interesting no the reason i ask this is we have two of our editors on the team are VAs themselves. They are just specialized in editing. So I was wondering, because you said you had overseas editors, how you guys got connected. So if they're not VAs, what is your sort of process and criteria of finding all of these awesome people who create the content and kind of making sure that they're a good fit for your business and your team? <clears throat> yeah, so, I mean, I guess maybe technically they're VAs, but they are <laughs> specialized in video editing. Um, I go through a staffing agency to hire my editors. Um, it is called virtual worker now. Um, and they're amazing because they take care of all of the 
kind of like payment, the legal, the hiring, like they take care of all that. And then I basically pay them a service fee. Um, and then they take care of all the payroll and stuff on the back end. Gotcha. Yeah. And it's easy because if one of my editors gets sick or is out or is, you know, takes vacation days, then they can either replace or have someone basically fill in that position for me. I don't have to do anything. So now my team has more flexibility. And then we also have more like a, a robust team that can s step in and fill roles as needed. So it's really nice from that aspect. Um, obviously, it's going to be a little more expensive than just hiring someone directly, not through an agency. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, it's worked out great. And I just have like a simple onboarding video and document for editors. You know, we hop on a call. I obviously send them a test video to make sure they can do a good job. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. What is your, your vetting process like in terms of identifying who can create a good clip or not? For sure. So obviously, I mean, <clears throat> I have a ton of people that reach out all the time who want to edit videos because it's the work, the I'll, I'll work for you for free crowd. Love that. Yeah. So I have a ton of that and I hired some people on like a part time basis early on. But since going through this agency, the nice thing is they really they kind of train the people for me, at least inside my systems. They'll say like, okay, here's the day-to-day -day process. One of my hmm. like senior editors who's been with me for a while, who's with that agency, will kind of take them under their wing and give them like some examples to test on. So we do that. Um, I have like a simple training video where it's like, here's like the A to Z process of like editing one of these short form videos, go through everything. Um, and yeah, really what I'm looking for is like, can someone create like engaging content that has like just the right amount of B-roll of animations, making sure they're like zooming in and zooming out, um, you know, not going crazy, make sure all the clips are proper, make sure there's no spelling errors. Um, all of that is like top of my list stuff that I look for um, in content. And then uh, let's see what else. I'm kind of losing my train of thought here. Um, You're good. Yeah, I would, um, I don't know. I guess that that's kind of it. Like they do a really good job of kind of training the editors for me inside of our systems. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely like looking at a video and being like, okay, this is like, I don't know. When you do it for a long time, you can kind of see like, this is someone who just kind of learned how to edit versus yep. this one is a killer who like. I've, I've had people send me ones that are like, I use an app for this or there's no sort of dynamic ch color change within the things. What I like to do, and it's funny to tie it back to what we were talking about before of making the mundane interesting is I will find maybe, I don't want to say dryer, all of our podcasts are bang bangers on BAM, but I will find maybe one of our more stat heavy where it's, you know, really into the minutia of the market podcasts. I'll send them that and then I'll send them one of our like highest performing clips. And I'll say, use this and get me as close to here as possible. Mm -hmm. And if they can get me blood from a rock, I'll be like, okay, this is, this is somebody who is, is able to create at a high level. For sure. Yeah. I love that. That's great. How, across how many time zones are you guys? Because you got eight people. Um, the reason I ask is because we are a largely remote company at BAM too. Most of the video staff is East Coast, but we do have our two VAs in the Philippines. So what is your sort of coordination with your video team like? Is it daily? Is it weekly? Day to day on Discord? Run me through that. Yeah. So the staffing agency, the VAs that I hire are all based out of Egypt. So they're over there. The nice thing about them and that situation is they work in my time zone on the west coast yep um but it's actually not horrible hours for them they just work like later in the evening but it's not like we're not 12 hours off um so like, like donnie and joe on the team are i give them the biggest kudos on our team because they're in the philippines they're 12 hours ahead so i'm like you guys are crushing it yeah that that's a tough one for sure going like 8 p.m to 5 a.m yep. um no i think our editors are their time zone, I think they're done at like 1 a.m., I want to say, maybe 2. Um, so it's really not too bad. Um, but yeah, they work on my time zone. Um, <clears throat> my CSM just moved from Oregon to Tennessee, but he's moving back now. Um, so he's, you know, my time zone. And then I have one other 
one other freelance editor who I've hired who's in Indonesia and he just works in his time zone, which is basically like either 4 p.m. or 5 p.m. my time to <laughs> basically, I want to say 3, 2 a.m. probably or 3 a.m. my time. So he basically works like my nights, mm -hmm. um, which is, I mean, it's good and bad. Like I, I can have maybe one editor like edit some stuff for a client in the morning and then he kind of turns stuff over overnight. So sometimes it's nice because a client gets a ton of work in one sure. day. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, it, it works out super well. Um, so basically we're all kind of West Coast time for the most part, um, minus one guy. So gotcha. Are you guys um I guess the more thing is is team meetings, I wanna say, and how you guys coordinate and all get around the campfire. We're on uh L uh EOS, the L ten system. Have you guys have you read traction? Um, I've not read traction. I have it in my audible library. Um, but I'm currently reading Profit First, so that's sure. probably that's probably the next one. You um, got to check out Traction. You got to check out EOS. Even if you don't go through the software and you just start implementing L10 meetings, um, that's something that Byron implemented, obviously, at the high level in his real estate team, and then at BAM, and we kind of trickled it down. It will so clarify all of the bullshit and like non-essential things and just get everybody laser-focused on what is the most important thing that's got to get done it is a game changer when it comes to managing a video team you got to check it out yeah i definitely will um i definitely don't waste a ton of time with meetings we don't do like hardly any meetings at all if i'm going to be okay. honest um, no, that's cool i use more my discord to kind of freely communicate um mm -hmm. where if i have a message i'll just send it out rather than taking up 30 minutes or an hour of everybody's time once a week i'll just you know, create a quick video, show them maybe an update, show them something that we want to tweak, something that we, that I like, that I want to maybe improve on or incorporate into our videos. And I'll more just like create a video and just send it to them and be like, Hey, like, here's something new that I'd love to like, have you guys look at, um, implement, let me know if you have any questions. So it's more like not taking them away from the task they need to do every day. And just like when they have time kind of see see different updates so yeah try not to waste a ton of time with meetings um i know a lot of companies waste a lot of time with useless meetings yep. and we did team meetings for a while like every monday morning we would meet but it just kind of got to a point where it was like we didn't need to do a team meeting every monday because there just wasn't enough urgent things to share or talk about so yeah, that's kind of why I do like the the videos now. It's normally just a Loom video. Um, Love Loom. Love it. Yeah. Share like some takeaways, some content I saw for the week, different things that I'm seeing that I'd like us to integrate and stuff like that. So I kind of do it that way. Yeah. I saw a great TikTok. It was a TikTok reel, something like that the other day uh, in terms of like video editing productivity. And this guy was like, I'm building an editing team. So he's like, so I filmed the walkthrough in Loom. I dropped the video into Descript to get a transcript, and then I dropped the transcript into Chat GPT, and I said, "Create me an SOP off this transcript." And I was like, "Shit, what a great idea! That's so that's so good. That's so good. That's really smart. Yeah, that is that is genius for sure. For sure. I was like, um, gotta start it. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I'm gonna try that out for sure. That's super smart. Um, I haven't used Descript a lot. One of my editors used it for a while, actually. One of the clients was like hey, I'm using Descript and I really like it. Like, can you edit in this? So we're like, yeah, sure. And he really liked it. So um, yeah, I don't know. I'll have to check it out. Yeah, Descript, from, from what I played with it, it's one of those uh, features not... it. The coolest thing about it is a feature and the minute Adobe saw that, they ate it. It was editing your video like a Google Doc, right? And the minute yeah. they were like, cool, great. You can do that in Premiere now. Mm -hmm. Um Obviously, in Premiere, having the most control over the captions is always going to be the way to go. You can get as crazy and over the top as you want to or need to to be. But Descript is great for beginners. I also recommend CapCut to people. I don't know if you guys have ever played around with that. Yeah, it's that's crazy. The, the, the yep. Anyone who's like not wanting to hire an editor and just like do it themselves or learn themselves, I'm like just use CapCut. Mm -hmm. Like whether it's on your phone or the desktop version, it's so easy. It's free. It's like it's a great starter starter tool. So that's like in my mini course, I teach people 
like how to use CapCut because it's just yep. a free, awesome video editor. I recommend to people like I don't I mean as a as a person who does this day and day at editing video, I don't understand why Apple hasn't made Final Cut better. And because CapCut is what Final Cut should be, right? Yeah. Like it is that it's the same UI, way more user friendly. You can edit on everything and it just works. Like yep. it's crazy. I don't know if you you know that TikTok also owns CapCut, right? Mm-hmm. So it's it's crazy how much of the social first features that they're pumping into there with um like the captioning and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So I definitely want to bring this in for a landing Connor. We could touched on a whole bunch of awesome topics here today. I gotta ask, and I like asking all kind of different people in the space, what's your dream project, man? If you you know, unlimited budget, unlimited camera. What what is it? What is yours? I always give the example like I would love to shoot a commercial for PlayStation one day. So what is your bucket shot dream project? I'm sure the people would love to know. That'd be sick. Yeah, um, I was kind of spoiled, and during my stint as like a freelance videographer, I traveled with a NASCAR team and filmed NASCAR races what? for a long time. So that was really fun, and it's kind of now be... you're bringing this up an hour in. That's so cool, man. Are you kidding? I know. I don't know. I forgot about that, but yeah. So that was an awesome experience, and got me into a sport that I never thought I would be a fan of. But my dream project. This sounds so funny, but it'd be like one of two things. One, I like would love to be a videographer for like a famous YouTuber and just like film their vlogs because. I don't know what and maybe it's just me maybe it was my experience at Vayner but like I love that type of videography and like documenting someone's day making it super interesting like I just think that would be super cool to like be like a famous YouTuber's videographer so that would be one thing or filming super dope house tours like uh Ennis I can't remember Ennis oh um, yeah 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 I, I know who you're talking about I don't know yes. his last name but the houses he tours are insane and being able to like travel with him or someone like that and film crazy mansions all over the place would be super dope before i let you go where can people find you you want people to find you your handles your stuff like that let them know for sure yeah uh instagram it's connor newell underscore underscore since uh last year this is another thing i skipped over but my instagram got hacked and deleted last year um so i know we'll have to do a part two i guess podcast part, part two, two um yeah so connor newell underscore underscore on instagram um that's the best place to connect with me all my stuff's there and yeah so definitely the easiest spot awesome well connor thank you so much for your time go check out connor's stuff and that was a pleasure talking to you man yeah appreciate you having me it was a lot of fun <laughs>